I will begin tonight with my essay on the raven. <clears throat> Randall Jarrell once wrote, quote, any poet has written enough bad poetry to scare anybody. In the case of Edgar Allan Poe, whose 200th birthday is Monday, January 19th, that is true. Yet the spell-casting pleasures of Poe's greatest poems are immense. Unlike many writers, Poe's best-known poems also happen to be his best. Poe's most exquisite poem of all, and his most widely known by far, is The Raven. The most consuming feature of Poe's work is that it's often completely improbable. This is both a criticism against Poe and a, a huge reason why he's still read today. It's not simply that Poe wrote improbable yarns of perilous events. The magic of his writing is how convincing and precise he was about what would otherwise be, in all other cases, unbelievable. Plausibly, yes. Late on a very dreary night, you or any of us might be reading about the death of a person, say, the death of a woman. And the melancholy tale might provoke your own tangled up grief, lament within a lament about someone you once loved and actually still loved, but is now gone. And yes, again, plausibly, a raven might just fly into your living room on such a night <laughs> because you let it in and because <laughs> The creature is there for a very specific, though ultimately undisclosed, design. So, on such a god-awful night, with such heat in your heart, you hear a disturbance. And though mildly sleepy, you go to check it out anyway. Here's the classic horror movie setup. You're walking right into it. Perversely, everyone else seems to know what's going on except you. Every bloody danger flag is flying in the midnight air, but the alarms are signaling in vain. Ever cool-headed in these moments, Poe has his bereaved lover, lover soldier on. Quote, back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, I said, surely, that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat th is, and let this mystery explore. Let my heart be still, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Yes, it's windy, brother, but no, that's not the wind. <laughs> Everyone knows what happens next. The raven's arrival has become one of the most memorable animal visitations ever published. <laughs> there are infinitely different meanings to any visitation, yet all agree upon one point. Such visitations are beyond the sphere of no normal linguistic articulation. Still, when a wild animal comes a knocking, in this case, the bird of ill omen, you know something's up. Someone's trying to tell you something. You probably already know it, but you need to hear it a few more times. Yes, a few more times. It's preposterous that the raven's harsh three-syllable refrain, nevermore, should perfectly eclipse Lenore's two-syllable name, but it does. This isn't a social visit. The fowl is not here to chat. It's here to seal the deal. Lenore is gone. For your own part, not only do you not flee, but in fact, you escalate the situation. There's a turn in my paper here. <laughs> the narrative is tight and well-crafted, but it doesn't fully account for the poem's extraordinary powers. Perhaps the liveliest aspect of The Raven is that the lines continually swell. It's a pushy poem. It's a relentless poem. It's a poem Allen Ginsberg once remarked upon in a grad class I had with him at Brooklyn College, brightening as he spoke behind his big glasses that has, quote, rhythm out the ass. <laughs> On the poem's unforgettable refrain, Nevermore, 
Poe himself commented that the pleasure is deduced solely from the sense of identity, a repetition. Elsewhere, in a much quoted passage from the poetic principle, Poe is, ex is exacting as a rager edge pendulum. Quote, I would define in brief the poetry, the poetry, I'm, I'm skipping a line. I would define in brief the poetry of words as the rhythmical creation of beauty. Its sole arbiter is taste. To feed desire for commentary on his famous piece, Poe penned The Philosophy of Composition. The essay stands as a bold statement on aesthetic thinking. It is uneven and it has its faults, but no writer, not even Whitman, took a more essentially serious view of his art. But it is here we also find Poe purporting to describe precisely the rational procedures he used to, quote, design his thrilling poem. Sections of the text are as madcap as some of Poe's characters. Quote, the work proceeded step by step to its completion with the precision and rigid consequence of a ma mathematical problem. Unquote. This is brilliant stuff, and certainly a plausible vision of, that some writers may entertain after the fact about their compositional methods. Still, in Poe's meticulous quest to demystify the raven, he actually deepens the lore and the mystifying air surrounding his poem. It's another dazzling performance. It was a savvy bit of self-publicity, too, that helped assure the longevity of one of Poe's greatest pieces. Literary reputations are notoriously fickle, and for Poe, this is painfully true. To say he has not always been embraced by the higher-ups, the mandarins of English literature, is an understatement. The list is impressive. Henry James and T.S. Eliot have, at times have bluntly dismissed him. In our own moment, Harold Bloom continues to discount Poe. Bloom writes, Poe's survival ra raises perpetually the issue as to whether literary mer merit and canonical status necessarily go together. I can think of no other American writer down to this moment at once more so inevitable and so dubious. <laughs> of course, I disagree with Professor Bloom on Poe, but I concede to Bloom, Eliot, and James that I too occasionally have my doubts. Case in point, in moments, I have a sinking feeling that the raven itself is not even a poem at all. It's rather a kind of aberration, a collective Jungian dream we've all had. Even people who know nothing of Poe know the poem. The raven is the rarest of birds, the poem you don't even have to know, to read to know. It spans the generations. My favorite contemporary version of this is Tim Burton's brilliant short, Vincent. The highly stylized black and white animation is an artistic conversation. From Poe to Vincent Price's Poe to Burton's own Poe, which involves all of the Poe's and more. Burton points the way once again about how Poe continues to speak to new audiences. In the last frame of his film, we find the young Vincent lying dead in the spotlight. This is before his no-nonsense mother enters stage left to mess up the fun. In perfect form, Vincent Price narrates the movie which closes on these lines, quote, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Academic, canonical, status aside, the raven is deeply embedded into our cultural DNA. Truth may be stranger than fiction, but it's nowhere nearly as bizarre as the operatic vision and version of the Simpsons take on the raven which we, sh we shall see tonight. The show itself has caught something of our menacingly quirky zeitgeist. The Treehouse of Horrors episode from season two, narrated by James Earl Jones, is one of the most successful adaptations of Poe for television. Poe's masterpiece plays directly into the strengths of The Simpsons. It's perfectly unbalanced, 70% precarious, 20% improbable, and 10% kooky. And if you suspend your disbelief, 100% believable. 
The genius of Poe, and, and the Simpsons for that matter, is that the seemingly arbitrary, which we call the improbable, becomes not only probable, but somehow completely real. And yes, entertaining too. And here is my closing thought, an unnerving one. If you read enough Poe, you're bound to have Poe-like situations happen to you. <laughs> Call it the Edgar Allan Poe effect. When the completely improbable becomes more and more probable in every passing moment, it's the unexpected sensation of reading a story only to find yourself in it. Find yourself in the very story playing out before you. It's something Borges learned from Poe and amplified in his own work. No, I don't mean you identify with the character. I mean you are the character. It's your 200th birthday, and you've been dead for 160 years, and a band of your followers is clamoring over your bones. One feisty faction wants to dig up your grave and move your remains from one city plot to another. Why doesn't this proposal seem a bit stranger than it is, Ed? Then your double unexpectedly shows up and you have to deal with him or her. Even now, someone or something is digging on the other side of the brick wall in front of the table where I am writing, where I was writing. It's weird. It's very, very weird. In an earlier draft of the same paragraph, Jane Birkin's gorgeous cover of Serge Gainsbourg's Nevermore began playing in an iPod shuffle. <laughs> with coincidence, with Poe, coincidence only takes you so far. You're either all the way in or you're not. There's no middle ground. This is my last paragraph. <laughs> in Poe's writing, every detail serves to feed the tale. It's not just that Poe's plots take unexpected turns. They do. But it's more that they never turn back around. He doesn't need to because he has written his pieces from the inside out. He wrote, quote, nothing is more clear than that every plot worth the name must be elaborated to its denouement before anything be attempted with the pen. Still, it's wondrous to ponder that Poe never really ties up his endings at all. The only thing tied up are those who actually are tied up.